Those of you who got an invite, welcome to Nerd Prom. <laughs> no matter where in the world you are, we're all Nerds International. With the hyphen. The Murder Homo Show presents the Savage Rifter Podcast. <laughs> oh, where are we? Oh my god, there's a robot! What? It's Run the away! Podcast. Welcome to the Savage Rifters Podcast, episode 21. I am one of your hosts, Gary, aka the Murder Hobo, and I am here with none other than world renowned and infamous Rift superstar, DJ Sexy Diaz. Y'all ready for this? Of the Savage Rifts G Plus community fame. Victor, lay it on me. Lay that sexy voice on me with your new microphone. Game on, Gary. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is the one and only Victor the Savage Rifter. You guys know where it is and you guys know what's going on because you are here listening to our podcast. If you haven't noticed, I got a new microphone, Gary. Yes, I did notice. I I do like the sexy. I I prefer sexy. We got it. Now we got to have a new segment. Sexy, sexy Diaz. Yeah. You can uh, write your questions to Victor, your your love questions, and then Victor will answer them in a uh, in a in a sexy bedroom man voice. No, <laughs> Victor's shaking his head. No, oh man. I think my wife's gonna look at me crazy if I'm into the microphone talking. Hey, baby, how you doing? This is a podcast all about Savage Riffs. We break down Savage Riffs piece by piece, so Victor can teach me and you, the listener, how to play, enjoy, and understand riffs. What are we doing today, buddy? As usual, we're going to be going over the Savage Rifts rulebook. We're going to be starting with cybernetics and adventuring gear and all the fun stuff that goes with it. Nice. There is some fun stuff that goes with it. With it. I'm kind yep, of excited about this. parts that we have lying around, we're going to put those on the arms, the legs, and other body parts that we don't talk about. Ooh, cybernetic sexy time. No. <laughs> All right, well, that's and it. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what's, uh, what's coming in from the riffs. Hi there, Mr. Suit-wearing guy. Yes, that's me. Don't I know you from someplace far? Yeah. Yeah, I do know you. What's new with you, man? Well, I, I suppose I can tell you what's new. From the Rifts. So, this week, what's new in the community? Not a lot, because we covered some stuff last week. So, now that we're on the ball, there isn't actually a lot of new stuff popping up. Um, we have... Anything can happen Thursday. I don't know if you saw this, Victor, but it is well worth checking it out. It's actually quite hilarious, and it did catch me off guard. Uh, Dustin Smith dropped in a Cyber Knight, and her seven companions appear. She needs the party's help as a shape-shifting necromancer. A wilderness scout and a warband of undead attack their cottage before chasing them through the forest. And then the image is Snow White and her seven dwarves. <laughs> like, that is awesome. And the artwork is actually really cool. She looks like a badass paladin, so that's pretty neat. But yeah, what a hell of a thing to throw in a game, man. <laughs> All I can say is what I quoted in the G Plus community comments. Laugh out loud. Yes. Oh, dear God. Yes. That yeah. is an awesome, awesome picture. I just so want to play it now. <laughs> How interesting is that? Then you got to think, have you ever seen... Um, what is what is the, the the fairy tale show that came on a couple of years back? Man, it's got to be in season seven or eight right now. Um, the, all the fairy tale characters come to Earth, yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to remember what the name of the show is. I know exactly what you're talking about. I haven't watched it in a couple of years, but it was really good way back in the day. My, I think my wife still sort of zooms in on it every once in a while. But um, there was a bunch of Peter Pan stuff. I think might have been the last season that I watched. But yeah, what a great show, man. I got to go back, maybe look at that thing and, and see if I can't spring some ideas from that well. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you can do. I know somebody was talking about, um, I had seen a picture of all the Disney princesses 
in like fantasy garb, you know, with swords and knives and just kind of a comic book version of all the Disney princesses. And I think it would be really cool to take an entire party and they go through a rift and they all turn into Dis Disney princess and they have to, you know, work through some of the plots of the movies before they have to, before they can come back. I think nice. that would be fun to play in rifts. Yeah. So if I was a Disney prince, which Disney princess would I be? <laughs> all of them. Um, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> Let's see. Um, there's Snow White. There's Cinderella. There's um, Rapunzel. Let's I'm go with Cinderella. The oh, mermaid, hi. Little I'm, mermaid. I'm Cinderella. Have you seen my slipper? <laughs> no, it goes like this. Hi, I'm Cinderella. <laughs> wow, this just like seriously took a turn for the worst. All right. Left in um, Albuquerque. Yeah, <laughs> so getting back to it. Um, <laughs> anything can happen Thursdays. Dustin always comes up with some interesting stuff. I love the Cyber Knight and the Seven Companions. I think that's a really neat twist on an old-fashioned fairy tale. But that's the kind of stuff that players remember. You know, that a lot of the times when you're at the table, all the interesting twists to the plots and stories and characters that we have it's what makes our game unique because what other game can you do that with it doesn't mm -hmm. exist as far as i'm concerned absolutely love it though dustin keep doing what you're doing we're gonna have to get you back on the show to talk about that absolutely hey to throw a twist on it too if you guys aren't familiar with um richard Wilcox's saga of the goblin horde inside that game one of the mechanics is basically you play this goblin I wouldn't say you're a goblin. You're, you're kind of a goblin boss, but not like the boss. You're not the head goblin guy. You still work for a goblin guy, but you do have goblin minions under you, and you can expend these minions inside of the game to do things. Like in for in one of the games that we played, uh, we had to cross this swamp, and at certain spots it got so deep that you could instead of uh, when you were making your rolls, if you failed. Say like your uh, your survival roll or whatever to sort of skip through this swampy area. You could expend one of your minions and basically stand on his head to get through this swampy area instead of taking like a level of fatigue, <laughs> which was a pretty neat kind of a sort of just a twist on it. But I I really like that idea with this Snow White. If you think about it, you could have her seven dwarfs that would take bullets for her. So something bad comes up and, uh, you know, she gets herself into a bit of a pickle and you can just sacrifice a dwarf to get yourself out of the deal. Huh? I love it. I love the idea. I can just see her going over there going, come here, grumpy. I'm tired of you <laughs> yeah. giving me that look all the time, giving me that lip. Step right here. And he falls into the mud and you just step right over him and leave. That's yeah. awesome. Or right, you send Sneezy over to go check out, like, the, what's in the dark <laughs> cave? <laughs> hey, hey, Grumpy, go open the chest. Kaboom. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I can't wait to use them now. <laughs> yeah, that's too fun. So Somebody um, write that up for me. Post it on the boards. I'd like to see the Snow White and her seven dwarves as a as a small war band or, a, you know, a cyber knight with a bunch of uh, minions there. That's kind of a cool idea. James Rocker put a question into the uh whatchamacallit the rules question steal on the savage we go. g plus yeah so here we go a techno wizard starts with three devices and the player chooses the master of magic edge as a veteran character can that player upgrade his three starting devices to do mega damage or would that require completely new item builds actually i think the mat the techno wizard starts as a master of magic doesn't he I have no idea. You're the professional here, buddy, but I'm going <laughs> to go look it up. I would professional, but uh, let's see what we can do about making that work. So you have a techno wizard that has the, that's a veteran, and he's going to take Master of Magic, and he so, wants to know if we can make all three items that he starts with, his three starting devices to do mega damage. Yeah, if he takes Master of Magic, can he automatically if, if update a, them? If it's an established character that's already gone in and, you know, he, he became a veteran and he got he was able to get that edge now, Master of Magic. And I would assume that's how it would be. You're not creating a new character. Um, off the top of my head, I would say no. The veteran character already had these three devices built and he had used their, they could, they're all techno wizard devices, I'm assuming. So now all of a sudden he gets an edge, he improves his magic, but it doesn't mean that all of his equipment and items that are starting devices go with him and become mega damage items. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm reading but, the techno wizard. Yeah, if he's, if he's an established one. Now, if it's a new character that you're just starting out as, and you're giving them, everyone gets, you know, start as veterans or whatever the GM wishes, and that's the starting devices, 
I'd leave that up to the GM. I'm sure the player wants it, right? Because that's three mega damage devices that you could have right off, right off the bat. But I'd leave it up to the GM to determine whether or not that's going to fit right into his game or not. So the Mystic starting character. Yeah, the Mystic starts off as uh, getting the the Master of Magic. Yeah, edge. they all do. All the all of the magic classes in or the archetypes get the Master of Magic edge. But I don't believe the Techno Wizard starts with the Master of Magic. Correct. Edge. It says that they do, though they do not begin as Masters of Magic per the right. edge. Techno Wizards have a flexibility few wielders of arcane power right. ever experience. Right. So they they don't get a start with it. Right. So from there, so be, so, yeah. So because of that, you have two options. If it's a new character, consult your GM and make sure it's okay with him for you to have you know three starting devices that do mega damage. If it's an established character that's just earned the veteran or the edge at, at the veteran level and they use it, they spend the edge in order to get the Master of Magic edge, um, I would say no because the items were created with spells that did not, before you had the Master of Magic edge. I would allow them to, at a reduced rate or at a reduced credit spend and you know to be able to turn those items into mega damage items, but I wouldn't charge him like to have to recreate all of the items all over again from scratch because he might as well be making new new items all the time. But you know, upgrade the current items he has to uh, mega damage items. Yeah, mega so damage devices. Master of Magic kicks in at seasoned. Um, true right. understanding of the ley lines, rifts, and eldritch flow of power through the world grants many spellcasters exceptional might and capability with their magic. A Master of Magic gains the mega power option for each power he knows upon taking his edge. Each time he takes a new power edge, he gains both the new power and its mega power use as well. So that is kind of a little bit tricky then, isn't it? Because if you're creating an item like um, a belt buckle shield or something like that, you've just created that sort of with a static low-level armor spell sort of a thing, or you know what I mean? Something like that. Yeah, I guess for the sake of the story or like narratively, once you've once you've picked up the Master of Magic... And you know you've you've met all the requirements. So once you get Master of Magic, then I guess that would the Techno Wizard get they they would get the Mega Power. So he would just be able to cast it, Correct. would he not? Yeah, that's one of the advantages of starting with the Master of Magic Edge is that you get all the Mega Powers. You get everything that does Mega Damage. But if you don't have it and you gain it later, it's kind of like getting a power boost to all of your spells. You know, your, your batteries become more powerful than they were before your internal magic batteries that you, the techno wizard or any other, uh, anybody who didn't have the master of magic edge, you know, that's a, that's a quick and dirty way to explain it. There could be a number of ways you can do it in the story, mm -hmm. but ultimately you start out with the, the non mega damage spells, you know, not the may and not any other, you get the regular powers, no mega powers. And then it's like somebody flicked a switch and, you know, all of a sudden your powers have matured and you can cast all of the mega damage. But when you're talking about techno wizard items, once the item is created, it is semi-permanently that way forever. Yeah. Unless you spend more money and energy and spells to improve the item you've created already. So a good example is a Wilkes laser pistol that is a Techno Wizard item. So now it shoots lasers, but it's powered by um, a Techno Wizard battery, which uses PE. When you created that spell, you used the bolt spell, but you didn't have the Master of Magic Edge. So now that gun is a bolt spell shooter, pretty much. But as soon as the Techno Wizard gains his, you know, that extra edge and uses the Master of Magic skill, well, now you have access to the Mega Bolt spell. But just because you have access to the Mega Bolt spell does not mean that that Techno Wizard laser pistol now shoots Mega Bolts. It was made when you had regular Bolt. So in order for you to um, make that pistol better, you would need to upgrade it by spending points, spending time and energy, um, upgrading that the crystals in it, more coils around the barrel, changing out the battery types, and maybe increasing the power usage and a lens focus and other miscellaneous things for the story. Then once that character has invested the time and money and energy into that pistol, make the rolls, spend the money, you know, wait four days, and poof, Bob's your uncle, and you have now have a mega bolt laser pistol. Mm -hmm. Does that make better sense to that? A little bit of clarity on that? That's Absolutely. a really good question. That's a really good question. I've had that um, asked to me before on Techno Wizards and how do you handle mega damage and non-mega damage items. And it's always good to have, you know, a Colt revolver. That's a normal takes bullets Colt revolver. And then you have a Wilkes laser pistol 
that is a techno wizard device, but it is not a mega bolt kind of weapon. And then you have like a mega bolt rifle. It's good to have those options because sometimes you want to hurt people or you only want to injure them or, or, you know, maim them instead of, you know, blow holes, blow ha half their body cavity. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what sometimes. happens when you use, you know, a mega damage laser pistol and riffs. Right. Occasionally, you don't feel like severing a leg when you put a bullet in it. So, you know, sometimes right. you just want a, a little graze here and there. Just, kind just of a want thing. to shoot the little toe off. You don't want to take right? the entire leg from the knee down. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, Techno wizard devices inside of Savage Rifts, just like they are in Deadlands. When you create this item, it has its own power pool of points. It works as its own device. You can actually give it to other people. Um, and they can use it. So let's say you did have a belt buckle that would cast armor, you know, press a button, boom, boosh, your shield pops up kind of a thing. Techno Wizard works the same way inside of Rifts, does it not? That's correct. For the most part, yes. Yeah. There are very, very few exceptions. But there, are, for the most part, if you pick up a Techno Wizard weapon and it's charged with PPE already, it's just like putting a, you know, an, um, an E-pack, an, an energy pack into a regular Wolf's laser pistol. And it's going to shoot until you run out of energy. Same thing with the Techno Wizard. You're going to shoot that gun for as long as it has PPE energy to do it. Now, if you don't have the ability to recharge it, well, when it runs out of juice, it runs out of juice. But if you're a techno wizard or, or a mage or someone like that, you'll be able to use your own energy to recharge it without having to change clips, without having to do anything. You just have to concentrate. And I think there's a role and you can um, recharge it a certain number of PPE every round or every um, up to its maximum or however much. Could you just stick it in a ley line? <laughs> um. Yes, I have allowed some items, depending on what they are, you know, you're not going to get like, you know, a nuclear missile or anything like that. That's a techno wizard device. Put it on a ley line, all of a sudden you can fire it. But small things, um, you know, a laser rifle, a laser pistol, depending on how much of a crutch I want to put on the GMs. Because yes, ladies and gentlemen, GMs do control the world. If you do not know that, you can slow the recharge rate that the ley line works with the techno wizard device because there are no rules on that even in well uh, before i put my foot in my mouth again um i don't believe there are rules on that in the savage rifts version but there are rules for recharging techno wizard devices on ley lines in the palladium but i don't remember which one it is but i know it's in there somewhere and the recharge weight was fairly slow you know you got a couple of ppe or a, a couple of rounds so to speak every couple of minutes or hours I'm not too certain on the duration, but I remember it being real slow. So if you slept there for eight hours, you might get a full charge or a half a charge on your on your clip, which is good because if you have 20 hits or 20 shots, that's at least 10 shots that you didn't have that are free. For me, I tend to control how much um, ammo and how much weapons the characters come across because I see weapons and ammo being a huge commodity in rifts. And I think it would be a lot rarer than people think. I live in the in the southwestern desert of Arizona, and if you walked out into the desert right now, I guarantee you will not find a loaded rifle. Up. Especially during an apocalypse or after an apocalypse, there's absolutely no reason why you killed three three um, jackalopes and all of a sudden they were all carrying laser rifles. Now, only in rifts is that possible, but um, I tend to manipulate that a little more than maybe some other GMs do. You know, you don't find grenades lying around; you have to steal them off somebody or or steal them out of a cache or you know, break into a coalition base or something. Um, and even then you'll be lucky to get a half dozen at most. Um, same thing with guns. You find a couple of laser pistols or just regular guns, but no bullets, no E-clip. Or maybe you find the barrel of a gun and now you need the other end. I, you know, it's just, it's that kind of um, control of the economy when it comes to weapon and ammo that I have found gives a GM really great control over how devastating or powerful your party can get. Because the last thing I need in my party is six glitter boys running around. Now, I'm not saying I haven't played Rifts or Savage Rifts with, with a six glitter boy party, but I have played Rifts where we have two working glitter boys, one with no gun, one that doesn't have a power source that's in the back of the truck, you know, and one with half a frame and a bunch of electronics missing and and then one that lost his armor and he's looking for it or he's trying to gain it back because he lost it in a war or a, a bet or whatever you know I, I i really really manipulate those controls and give the character something to go after and it's a really good way to be able to control your party and control how much their damage output is and also um how much they can take that, that, that's a really really big 
important part of the game, particularly for Savage Rifts. In fantasy games, modern games, sci-fi games, that's not necessarily the case. I've gone Gonzo and everybody gets, you know, Vorpal weapons and it's a free-for-all. I've done that too. But um, in this game, I tend to see it more as um, weapons and armor and, and bullets are really, really hard to come by and people trade in bullets. That's what we used to do in the Old West. When there's no money, that's what they would do in Rifts. Back in my day. <laughs> Back in my day. Oh. To school. Uphill both ways. Uh, Mad King Christopher. I'm playing a super powered character with super strength. D12 plus four. He's throwing an unconscious coalition grunt in dead boy armor. <clears throat> Excuse me. At another grunt. After oh, a yeah. hit. Body chucking. That's what I'm talking <laughs> about. After a hit, damage is strength. D12 plus 4 plus improvised weapon. 200 pounds. D12 plus 1 equals 2D12 plus 5. Normal equals normal damage. Obviously, the grunt is not going to be damaged by the attack. On the other hand, I feel he should at the very least be knocked down. Suggestions. You are correct on your math. You are going to do a D12 plus 4 and a D12 plus 1 because of the improvised weapon. But it's not going to be mega damage. It is going to be normal damage. So you have that part of it correct. You're the GM if you want that that player to knock the other player or the other enemy down by throwing a body at him. Sure, let it happen. Why not? Unless he's throwing it at a coalition grunt that's a juicer or a really big dog boy or a power armor. Because what those guys tend to do is catch the body and throw them back at you. And <laughs> it usually hurts a lot more when they do that because they tend to throw, catch the body, run 100 yards and throw it at you just to get you know some running room to be able to do that. Um, as the GM, you have the right to make that decision. If you want to knock the player down, knock the player down. But typically, I would not get a knockdown unless there was significant advantage. If it's just one dead boy against another dead boy, go crazy. Knock yourself out. Knock both of them out. Break his ribs. Have him you know, break an arm or just give him a concussion, whatever the case may be. Um, but you have to take that on a on a case by case basis. I would allow the normal damage. I would allow at least a pushback or a loss of an action, just because. Hello, two hundred man just got thrown. Two hundred pound man just got thrown at you in body armor. Yeah, good luck with that. Play mm -hmm. catch. Yeah, I would say that if you realize that you're not going to be doing any damage, what? Why bother trying to throw the guy at him if you're not going to yeah. get something out of it? And yeah. I, I totally agree. One of the things that you have to be aware of is that most of the time coalition dead boy armor is pretty in Palladium's version. It's mega damage armor. So laser weapons, missiles, bullets, everything's going to bounce off of it. If it's normal damage, if you're going to throw a coalition dead boy at him, um, yeah, maybe lose an action. I wouldn't say necessarily knock him down. Maybe if he surprised the other soldier and threw the body at him and didn't see it coming and lost his balance and poof, you know he falls over. I would definitely maybe push him back or lose an action. But um, yeah, that armor is going to be able to stop a lot of the, not the inertia, but a lot of the impact damage. You, you can roll 2d12 plus 5 all you want. They can explode all you want. At the end of the day, it's considered heavy armor. You're not going to do any damage. Yeah, your intent mechanically at that stage of the game should be to use the like push mechanic where you're actually like, right. you know, your, your intent is to knock him down and that's all that you're right. trying to get out of it. At least that way right. you have now, the chance of moving him. Right. Now, one of the wonders about Savage Worlds is now here is where if you have a character with super strength that can pick up someone and throw them, which clearly that's what he's talking about. Why are you not doing a power trick or a mm -hmm. skill trick? Yeah. Take the body and I throw it at his legs to knock him down. I'm going to do a skill trick. You know, you're going to use your throwing skill, definitely not shooting skill, or you're going to make a strength check maybe, uh, you know, to shot put that body. And, and, you know, he do the good old fashioned, grab him by the ankles, swing around in a circle and let him go and use him like a boomerang and take the other guy's legs out. That's different than I pick up the grunt and I throw him at the other guy. That, there's two different actions. Now, granted, mechanically, they're similar. But if you decided to go with the trick, um, a skill trick, an athletic trick, uh, you know, throwing trick or even just a strength trick, um, I would let the players do that. And then if it was successful. Even without a raise, if he, if he just was successful with it, I'd allow the knockdown. Sure, why not? It's very cinematic. It's very um, Savage Worldsy. I think mm -hmm. it would work great. I think it would work great if you if you change that. But if you're just throwing bodies just to just for the sake of throwing bodies, there is a chance that the other guy might be able to catch him and just you know hold on to him or something. Especially if you roll poorly. Yes. So do you know that they're changing the uh, test and tricks, um, uh, test of wills and and tricks rules? I was just reading an email, or excuse me, an announcement that was made 
by Savage Worlds um, on the Google Plus page just today. I believe it was, oh gosh, who was the the wonderful lady over at Pinnacle Entertainment? That Jody? That. Jody, yeah, had actually put something um, together saying that Shane had put this out in an email to everybody who was backing it and all this other stuff. And they were, he was talking about the skill tricks and the different types of um, tests that you can do in the new rules. Oh, here it is. So she said, um, hey, friends, you've been seeing some of the upcoming changes to the Savage Worlds Adventure Edition here on our website. Here's a little extra for you. We embrace the athletic skill first previewed in the Savage Worlds of Flash Gordon, which is linked to agility. Some say it would be linked to strength. And of course, you're welcome to do that in your game. But here's what we came down with it. Now, she goes into somewhat details and some other considerations that they've talked about. But this is directly from Shane Hensley, the creator of Savage Worlds. And a couple of bullet points that are important. Pure strength tasks, such as lifting or pushing an object, are still just strength rolls. But climbing, swimming, throwing are all covered by athletics. And while strength is certainly important to those as our smarts and spirit, agility is as well and covers the other athletic skills that strength does, such as walking a tightrope or catching some. So right there, you're going to see that a lot of the tests that we're doing and a lot of the questions, the question that was just asked, it's clearly going to turn into a, um, it's going to turn into a test, but this time it's not going to be a strength test. And the athletics test is going to be tied to agility. Yeah, pretty cool, eh? So rather than just have like the two where you're doing spirit Correct. versus smarts or, you Correct. know, whatever the other one is, they've changed it up so that you actually have this opened envelope now of what you can do. So the tricks and test of wills are now going to be set up like this. So the support option allows a character to help out an ally. Test is the opposite. It lets him make things more difficult for his foes. So tests include embarrassing an opponent, throwing sand in his eyes, staring him down with a steely gaze, or anything else a clever player can think of to rattle his enemy and pull him off balance. Throwing a body at him. Exactly. And then... Yeah, exactly. Um, so whatever your throw is linked to, you throw, make your throw roll, it's and then... Okay, there you go. Well, it would be, this is the thing, it's, it's, if you're throwing the body, you make your throw roll, like you're throwing something, right? Correct. But Correct. it's opposed by your, your opponent's strength. So if you're throwing it at him, and this is the, one of the cool parts about Savage Worlds, you get a, when you, when you roll that throwing dice, if you don't like the number, man, you throw in a Benny, I mean, try and get that up. Re-roll. Re-roll <laughs> re -roll that bad Right? Man. Yep. And then right. it's opposed by the other player's strength. So yeah, all and don't forget, you're getting a wild die with these because these are tests. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's, that's how everything either one could explode. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there's a good possibility that the enemy can catch that body and throw it back at you. Next thing you know, you guys are playing catch with a 200. <laughs> but yeah, that's the uh, that's the deal. So to perform a test, the player describes his action, works with the game master to determine the most appropriate skill to roll for it. Yep. Then yep. the player makes his uh, makes an opposed roll resisted by whatever attribute skill it's linked to you want to shoot somebody it's opposed by agility or if you're just trying to do it for uh for a gimmick like you know normally you would shoot somebody to actually try and do damage but yeah. let's say yeah. uh you're trying to shoot him just maybe to intimidate him and that's how i'm gonna sure. you know shoot my gun sure. near his head and uh you make your shooting roll and then he has to save versus his agility so it's kind of neat how they're switching it up it allows you to do a lot more with tests and uh, tricks and tests of will, which I yeah, think is really cool. Yeah, now it's no longer just, um, well, there, there'll be more opposed tests versus just go to target number. Yeah, always. Make more sense? Yep. And these things are yeah. great too because, you know, you go up against a tough opponent or something like that and you really need to team up inside of Savage Worlds. Uh, you need to get your yeah. gang ups and... Uh, you know, all of those um, like wild attacks or whatever it is you're yep. going to try and take the guy's parry works, down with. Yep. All of that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what you need to do. Add, let the math work for you, not against yeah. you. It's pretty sweet. So that's it for uh, what's new. New sniffing, snuffing, and we're out. Let's get over to the nexus points. We're going to start talking about some cybernetic stuff because we've been rambling. We're ramblers. Victor, do you know that? Rambling, rambling, rambling.
Nexus points. Ladies and gentlemen, look at that. Page 100. I never thought we'd get there. Yeah, it's been taking a while. We're 21, 21 episodes in. <laughs> that, that, that's about five five pages an episode. That's not too bad. Uh, it could be worse. Yeah. Well, there's so much stuff in here, too. Like, this is... it's. It's the same game that I, this, I keep telling everybody. The riffs is the same game. You're just throwing more dice. There's there's just a touch more math that you got to do. What's wrong with that? We all you like know. to throw more dice. Yeah, you're not doing math between one and ten. You're doing math between like twenty and forty, and then doing figuring out all those numbers. So, yeah. Easily. That said, uh, we, were, we were just talking about that at the last game that we played for Savage Riffs, and everybody was like, "Does anybody remember rolling under 15? <laughs> it's been forever since we've rolled a low roll like somebody said i rolled a 14 once and that was the last time we heard that so um cybernetics man also referred to as bionics sure. are a pervasive near pervasive sure. nearly ubiquitous part of life on riffs uh, this stuff is pretty slick man because uh, not only have do you have all of the options that you can use inside the book uh, cybernetics man should allow you to make your own stuff I want to have like yeah. my cybernetic there's spatula hand. There's no reason hand. why you can't. Yeah, there, there's absolutely no reason why you can't. Just like we always do in Savage Worlds, file off the serial numbers and take a look at some of the other powers and existing enhancements and cybernetic systems that are there and just take those bonuses and use them in a different way. Um, you know, trappings is the key part of Savage Worlds and you can easily do that same type of stuff with a power. You know, a bolt spell can be, you can take the stats and put it into a laser rod in your forearm, all of a sudden a hidden weapon in your forearm, and it's using the stats of a, of a bolt. I mean, it, it, just do it, right? It's Savage Worlds. That's what it's all about. But in the cybernetics for Savage Rifts, cybernetics, bionics, it's all the same thing. The only thing you really got to worry about is strain. Um, strain is the amount of cybernetics that you can have on your body. You know, you replace so many, a full walk and cyborg. Yeah. And so depending on what your archetype is or you know, what you're taking, you have, each one of them sort of has a similar, like six six strain would be common, right? And then Correct. depending, some of them will, will allow you to, to get more, plus there's edges that will allow you to buy more, so you could get it up there. But if you go, and then when you buy cybernetics, some of them are worth maybe one point, some are worth maybe two, so you can have varying numbers of, um, of strain applied to your character, and... Sure. The last thing I was thinking of was the edges. You can you can buy edges to uh, increase the amount of slots and stuff. Did I just say that? Why am I having a brain fart now? I'm totally leaving <laughs> this in. No, you're you're totally right. You are allowed to purchase an edge that is going to increase the amount of points that you get in your strain rating. So most folks have a strain of about five or six. Each level of strain beyond your character's max causes you to get a level of constant fatigue. Two levels beyond that. Um, or a, a level of fatigue up to a maximum of two levels beyond that. If you've got anything more than that, you've got too much bionic so much that you can't physically move anymore. It's painful. You can't feel your body parts. Or, um, <laughs> the only time. <laughs> yeah, Cybernetics yeah, right? sound like old age all of a sudden. <laughs> it's all the same. It's all back in my day. Um, uh, can't feel my leg. <laughs> I can't feel my leg. Hold on. Hold on. Um, Usually the only time that happens is when you take on too many, too much fatigue from strain is because um, usually you've been put into slavery and forced some, and you already have implants. Um, so that can be a problem in some cases. Um, I've had that happen in the games that we've played for Rifts where the, you know, the cybernetics uh, fighter or whatever you want to call it, uh, ranger, hero, just one too many. We got captured. He replaced a few parts and put some in him. And now everyone around, he's C-3PO steroids. It's just ridiculous. Um, but it, it it can happen usually forcibly. Hero's, kind of hero's journey is what I was thinking of when I had my brain fart. You can also mm -hmm. get cybernetics yeah. at character yeah. creation through yeah. that. With, if you have too many cybernetic devices and you're taking um, minus two to fatigue all the time because you have all of right. these extra devices. So you're maxed you, out and you're two levels beyond that, which means you would take about eight strain. So if somebody yes, you always have that penalty. Yeah, somebody farts in your general direction and you take a level of fatigue from it, you're incapacitated. Spend a penny. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah. Yeah, if they blow on you too hard, if you fail a con roll, if, you know, yeah, if you just take one level of fatigue or if you take one wound, um, that's it. You're you're, you're going to be down and out. It, it, it's supposed to be really inhibiting because, you know, once you start reaching that level of you're more machine than man, 
um, that's not where you want to go. You you don't want to go into that kind of abyss, so to speak, because then you just become a robot. You you lose self control. You no longer have control of your own body. You're just a brain in a bucket. <laughs> uh, that actually sounds pretty good. I think that's kind of where we're heading as a human race. You know what I mean? That's called the combat cyborg, and yes, that's pretty cool. But the combat cyborg, if you go look and see how they took care of strain, they give it the um, some of the edges that allow it to double its max strain because becoming a cyborg means you replace all of your um, meat parts for mechanical parts. So you immediately start with six strain, but because the edge of combat cyborg doubles it, it allows you to take on six extra points of strain. But there are also some fall, some you know fallout from you replacing all of your body parts. Gotcha. So there, there really is no difference between cybernetics and bionics. They're generally interchangeable, is what it says here. So, you know, yeah, pretty much. There's, there's not really. They wrote a paragraph in here about it, but basically, doesn't it? Just says that it is what it is. Okay. All right. So installing and removing cybernetics. You get too many. Maybe you're tired of rolling your fatigue. You can take them out. Sure. You want to get rid of that eight track and put in a CD player? <laughs> Why not? Um, yeah. Sometimes it's better to reduce your strain. Um, you know, for example, say you have one point of fatigue above your maximum. So you're now you're taking one point of fatigue all the time and you're tired of, you know, not having those extra points or not having that all those penalties on you all the time. You know, it's time to dump that eight track and not upgrade and just stay with the fatigue that you or stay with the cybernetics that you have. That's one good example. Um, a lot of the times, too, um, you'll want characters will have systems removed, but mostly it's for upgrading their systems. You want to change your arms out to different types of hidden weapons, leg replacements, you know, more um, durable armor plating and so on and so forth. Gotcha. Uh, you know, it, it's funny because I was always under the impression that Rifts was a post-apocalyptic world, but it, it really isn't. It's really sort of well beyond that. And there's like some serious thriving cities with hundreds of thousands of people and, you know, complex um E economies and and the like and stuff like that like um isn't isn't storm spire one of them that's kind of like a great city and and what are the other cities kind Let's of off see, topic but be, <laughs> no well shy town is going to be your biggest it's pretty much a mountain range of cities um it's absolutely huge and probably the largest or one of the largest protected um human cities still left on rift's earth where is um, it at chicago shy town okay Gotcha. Or the ruins of Chicago. It's slightly south of what old Chicago would um, And it takes up most of the state of Illinois. That's how big the city is. Wow. That's crazy yeah, big. Really, really huge. There's a couple of um, all the people from Northern Gun, Northern Gun up in um, that part of Canada, mm -hmm. uh, north of the lakes, all the way down in, towards Maine. Um, there's a lot of larger cities out there, maybe not as large as Chi-Town, but definitely large uh, metropolises out there. There's the two major magic cities. Which are also on the East Coast. Storm Spire uh, and some, some uh, other one that I was reading about. So Yeah, my mind just went blank on that That's one. okay, because the reason I was asking is it's because it's like when, when they're talking about like installing and removing cybernetics, I'm thinking to myself, where do you get a doctor? Where do you find the cybernetics? Yeah. And, you know, where, where do you have like a hospital that you could perform these things? Because, you know, you're not doing this in a ditch in the side of the road uh, after you just find some guy with like some kind of cool cybernetic eye, right? But... And, and they, they really play up like the post-apocalyptic kind of a sure. deal inside of Rifts, but there there really are some some well-founded cities with trade and commerce, and you sure. know, like political parties and, and sure. Just all because that kind it was an apocalypse doesn't mean that life stopped. Yeah, you know, this we isn't... didn't we didn't freeze the planet one year after the apocalypse and the radiation went away. Life continued, you know, things continued to procreate. People continued to have children. Um, somebody picked up the, you know, picked up the telephone lines and connected them all back again and, or tried to do it in some places. And, you know, someone learned how to use magic to rebuild their home. And there are castles, there are forts that are small towns. There are, you know, Southwestern cowboy towns. There's, um, you know, Midwestern farm towns. There's religious sects. The, the, all kinds of different things all over the world, not just North America. North America just tends to, but the game was, but I mean, there's a, there's a city outside on the South end of, um, uh, on the South side of the Grand Canyon where all the Lynn cereal live. There's a, you know, a huge city, thousands of them live there. These golden eagle headed um, flying humanoids, um, just really, really different, unique, characterizations of all the stuff we've ever read throw it all into riffs and put it in the blender because that's pretty much what they do and and when the apocalypse did happen there was a war that was going on long before that 
and the war was amongst all of the Americas and, you know, the world was going at it. And there was a really high level of technology at that time. Cybernetics, bionics, the Glitter Boy armors were made. Um, the only thing that wasn't around were the ley lines and magic. So we were at a much more advanced new age of technology. So much so, it's that technology that caused it to destroy ourselves. And in that great apocalyptic explosion war, in a short amount of time, so many people died. So many souls were released out into the universe that it they say that that was one of the triggers that caused the world to bring back the return of magic and charge the ley lines. Um, one good example is where in the Midwest, there are some mounds where Native Americans have been burying their dead for millennia. And it is said that there are ley line vortexes and nexuses in or around those mines or all those mounds because of that. They're some of the most powerful ones on the planet because of all the life force and everything else that's there. Um, and they have said that it's also one of the most dangerous because rifts open up every minute, every other every <laughs> minutes. You get, a, you get a nexus point and it opens up a huge rift every couple of hours, like clockwork. And just walking around there is dangerous. It's actually one of the few things that keeps the Zydekicks on that side of the Midwest versus coming to the central Midwest or the eastern part of the United States. Wow. I was... Um... Listening to a podcast the other day, I don't remember which one it was, but it was all, could have been 99% invisible, I'm not sure. But they were talking about people that just like outright disappeared. Um, this one guy was in jail. So this is like way back in the 16, 17, 1800s, I don't know, somewhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. And he goes to jail and he's on this chain gang and they're going from like some city to another city or something like that. And the deal is, is that he literally like just started to like fade out, like become see-through and then just disappeared. And it was just yeah. weird. It just made me think of it like all these riffs popping up all the time. And I'm, and I'm picturing like, a, you know, some kid on his bike delivering the newspapers or whatever. And a portal opens right in front of him. And bloop, he's gone. <laughs> That's it for yeah, him. Yeah, there's this. Yeah, there's this crazy phenomenon in riffs that they call the ghost towns and or ghost cities, too. Um, you could be driving along you know, an old broken highway path right in the middle of wherever Germany. And next thing you know, you, you know, you go over a hill and you see in front of you and there's nothing grasslands and trees and everywhere you can see. Then you go down into the valley and you go across the same, you know, the following hill and you're expecting to see nothing. And you see like a medieval town kind of fading into view right in front of you as you're driving into town. You're like, that was not there five minutes ago when I crested the hill the last time. <laughs> now it's here and people are kind of fading into existence, kind of becoming solid. They're not ghosts They're You know, you can see them, hear them, smell them, talk to them now. And you could spend a whole day or 12 hours or two hours with them. And next thing you know, they start to do what, exactly what you just said. The entire town starts to fade away and they become fade towns, ghost towns, and they just fade away from existence. They may come only on the winter solstice, maybe every third Thursday of the week or the month twice or three times a year on certain holidays it could be whatever you want it to be or they could come in and out of existence every 24 hours they come in for 24 hours and they disappear for 24 hours. and there's many fade towns that we've um you know created and appeared and thrown all over the place um carnivals um, small cities maybe just one big apartment building you know a, a ghetto apartment building from you know um in from new york city appears in the middle of the you know the, the midwest or the desert of Arizona or somewhere south of Texas, and everybody there doesn't know the difference. They just think it's just another regular part of the day. <laughs> that's actually really cool. That sort and of that's opens the really up. weirdness of riffs. There's a lot yeah. of weird stuff in there. Just so much content to go through. You can only put so much in the books. You just roll into a town that's like full on like seventies, you know, Starsky and Hutch and sure Bell sure. Bottoms afros yeah. and <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean, boogie down. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, so. Cybernetic systems. What is what? What kind of stuff can we slap on to people? I see that there's a whole section here for bio enhancements and replacements, and then I guess it says that they assume partial or full replacement for legs. Could you get like uh, cybernetic legs with a kickstand? So like you know, if you were you know tired or whatever, you just bust out your kickstand and sort of lean sideways. Sure. Why not? Yeah, those are simple little enhancements you can have for entire limb replacement. So even if you wanted like an extra set of legs or an extra set of arms, you could throw that in there. Um, the typical one that everybody likes to have whenever they get cybernetics is armor plating. Um, that's really easy because you can't get rid of a cyborg's frame that easy. Plus, it gives you four MDC armor, so that's a pretty that's a pretty good deal for only forty thousand credits. Only. Wow, yeah, that's not bad at all, yeah. man. Plus four to armor and it's MDC. That's actually pretty yeah. sweet. 
Well, yeah, but the price of it is three strain. Ooh, yeah, that's stiff. <laughs> yeah, that's what she said. Oh, snap. Victor Sexy Voice Serrano. Well, that's what she said. Adrenal system. The bio-enhancement of the internal adrenal network. Sweet. So this is kind of like a little bit of a juicer kind of a thing where you can slap that on there, press a button, and uh, and away you go. Oh, this is just recover from shaking. Yeah, but the nice thing about it is you can stack it with combat reflexes, and a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the times when you have edges, cybernetics, bioware, bionics, any kind of replacements, almost always typically stack with the bonuses you already have. So, for example, if you have combat reflexes, you're going to get a bonus to recover from shaken, but you're also going to get that if you have an adrenal system, so now instead of plus two, plus four, and so on and so forth. Wow, you can get like bionic strength augmentation and it's like new arms new legs new spine new bones all that kind of stuff so that you're actually like super strong well that'd be awesome because you can you imagine you're playing like a scientist or a rogue scientist or whatever and you have a d8 strength and you're like you know you're envying that juicer for picking up the tank and throwing it at the the robots in the coalition the last time you want to be able to do the same thing so you get cybernetic arms and you're still the rogue scientist but now you get to roll a d12 when you throw that tank around and it becomes mega or yeah it becomes um, mega strength so you're able to pick up all the heavy things tear off the telephone poles hit people with tree trunks motorcycles like <laughs> oh Lots that sounds fun. fantastic there's nothing funner than smashing people to death with uh, tree stumps, right, right, Wesley. If funnest, you're listening, funnest character in in comic history, in comic book history, is Hulk. The Hulk smash. That's all you got to say. Everybody knows it, and it's so much fun. Um, extra set of arms. I like that. That's pretty sweet. Yep, you can scratch your butt and fire that cannon all at the same time. Or, or well, yeah, and well, okay, we're just gonna leave that one there. I'm not touching <laughs> that one. There's lots of variations on cybernetics. I mean, internal life support, load-bearing reinforcement, you know, increases your strength and allows you to carry more weapons or more items or whatever. Um, in the internal life support gives you resistance to radiation, intense environmental temperatures, lots of other fun stuff. Um, nano repair systems, that one's kind of a given, gives you a resistance or a bonus to bleeding out. Um, reinforced frame, again, you want to be like um, Wolverine and drop adamantium onto your skeleton. That's what you want to do. Reinforce frame will give you that. It gives you a plus two to toughness because if anyone who's tried to pick up um, good old uh, Wolverine, they've noticed that he does not weigh 200 pounds like you would think he would, despite the fact that he's short. Ooh. But <laughs> but even though you have all these cybernetics, the one kicker to that is, for those of you who don't have the book or haven't been um, paying attention, cybernetics are expensive. For example, oh, yeah. reinforced frame, 150,000 credits. Load-bearing reinforcement. 120,000 credits. Now hold on to your horses. Nano repair system is a quarter of a million credits. <laughs> Ouch. That's so stiff. open up your bank accounts and be real friendly to the black market guys because they're going to be the ones that you're going to be negotiating this with. But everything from secret compartments to synthetic organ replacements. And there is a whole slew of other type of enhancements you can have when it comes to Bioware or Bionics. So take a look at the book. Go look and see all the fun stuff that you can do. And if you're really into... um terminator combat cyborgs and that kind of stuff everybody can find some kind of bonus out of cybernetics and not take and not and it won't be too expensive and it won't be too penalizing to your character if you compare to how many bonuses and other things you're going to get with it so try that out take a look at those and see but i will warn you if you are a magic user do not get cybernetics it makes casting spells a lot harder well what if you got a secret compartment and you hid stuff in it that's kind of, you know, one of those maybes. As a GM, I would love to see a mage with a secret compartment. And in that secret compartment, he keeps a magic wand. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be kind of cool, kind of cool to do. And considering it's not that expensive and it's not too invasive, um, I believe it only takes up um, the secret compartment says unlimited. So you can do it as many times as you want up to the number of strain points that you see so if you're just going to use one just for that, um, I would allow it and I would allow him. I, I may allow him not to have. Um, a lot of penalties to uh, to his casting roles or to his spell casting or arcana roles. Um, if maybe if he paid a little more, because it only has a cost of twenty five hundred credits. It's cheap, but man. I would I would allow him to I would allow him to do it if he paid a little extra to take a little care on the on the cutting for that. I'm down with just getting secret compartments, and then I would just have a stash of stuff, 
how many times have we been locked up, thrown in jail, put in a dungeon, uh, you know what I mean, tied down uh, to yep. the point where you got nothing. And not not this guy. Yep. Secret compartment for days, bro. Yep. I got a blender, a <laughs> one juicer. In, one in every. <laughs> right? Margaritas for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I got some apples, <laughs> knives, cutting boards. Like, you know, just... that's, that's, that's not a bad way to go. If you're going to be playing like, you know, one of the men of arms, for example, again, we go back to the rogue scientist. You spend three points on secret compartments, you can easily carry around a, a miniature toolkit a blowtorch and you know a, a light holdout pistol or something you're pretty much set even if you get you know stripped naked you could still reach into your thigh and pull out the blowtorch and cut your chains off or whatever and you have that gun and you know your left forearm to to be able to shoot someone with or protect yourself with and well you can always use a toolkit for all kinds of things so if, if you stuff some grenades in say yeah. a secret compartment and then somebody yep. blasted you with a gun would you make the your only- player Roll oh yeah, I'd make the grenades up. go off. Oh, you better yeah. believe it. But the only time I would let the grenades go off is if someone did a, rolled all once. You know, so they have you get two dice, right? Your your skill roll and your um, yeah and your extra dice. And if you rolled, if you came up all aces, uh, excuse me, all um snake eyes on all those. Oh, you better believe someone's someone's grenades are gonna start ticking or going off. Yeah, yeah. It's you better be hope that your damage. your secret compartment is nowhere you're near your crotchial area, or you can say you know bye bye genitals. <laughs> yeah, but you can always have them replaced. That's can one you? of the last things on the list is synthetic organ replacement. Um, you have an unlimited amount of synthetic organ replacements. So you can get rid of your of meat in place of artificial systems that dramatically enhance the cyborg's overall resilience or performance. Sweet justice. Yeah. Could I get at like 100, a... At 100 grand a piece, though. That's, it's pretty pricey. I want, I want a lightsaber wiener with actual disco balls. Yeah. Somehow... That is getting me out of a predicament. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, hey, Stan, take a look at this. Uh, guard, can I have your attention, please? <laughs> You're going to blind him with your bedazzling? <laughs> right? My bedazzled <laughs> junk. Um, nice. What's under combat enhancement? We got embedded combat coding. So what does this yeah, do? So that's that's real easy. That's just cyberwired re- cyber wired reflexes. You know, you're able to get some um, specialized training and capabilities of some combat edges that are into your nervous system. And it gives you a little bit better edge when it comes to uh, fighting skills. Um, but they're, they're pretty cool. It's a little expensive. They're $20,000 for novice to veteran skills or 50,000 credits for heroic or legendary edges. So pretty much you're putting a chip into your brain that a uh, Gives your gives you the ability to use the edges that um, most combat edges that is for most uh, warriors will use. It just gets a little pricey on which edge you decide to use. I'm, I'm trying to read how it works, but I'm, I'm I don't know if my eyes are going foggy or what. So it allows you to take edges, combat edges. Yeah, combat edges, and they get wired directly into your systems. So as long as you have at least one level of cyber wired reflexes, you can take embedded combat coding yeah well, and you I can don't... take as much combat coding as you want so pick an edge out of the list of combat edges that are in the rule book and this embedded combat coding duplicates that edge gotcha for for depending on what level of edge it is if it's a novice edge all the way up to seasoned or veteran it's going to be twenty thousand dollars an edge if it's a heroic edge or a legendary edge it's going to be fifty thousand dollars an edge essentially but you have to have cyber wired reflex as a requirement yeah. Essentially, this is just letting you buy edges, is what it's doing. Yeah, at the cost of your strain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, so you can, I, only, I you can only take so many. Even if you took one level of cyber wired reflexes, well, now your strain is five instead of six. And if you take five edges, you can say you take five legendary edges. That is a quarter million dollars in combat coding, and you're at full strain, and you can't take any more cybernetics at all. You know, you can't throw combat armor or. Um, bio armor you can't get a reinforced frame you can't replace limbs if they get blown off you can't upgrade your cyber wired reflexes either you can't get any synthetic organ replacements because you've had too much extensive work on your body to get these combat coatings you know edges put into your system but if you got that kind of money and you're a low-level character sure why not eventually you could probably pay to have someone take them out but that's yeah a whole nother- yeah i just wasn't quite sure or i wasn't getting the gist of i didn't understand why wouldn't you just take the edge but I, but what this is well, actually doing is it's you allowing can, right? you to say, yeah, say you're like only a seasoned character. Mm-hmm. You're only going to have a couple of edges to buy to begin with. So yeah. say you wanted, you know, you come into some money, you've had a yeah. cyber doc who owes you some favors or whatever. 
he's going to hook you up with cyber wired reflexes and um you know a couple of combat coatings and next thing you know you know five hundred thousand dollars later you can do a whole lot of fun stuff that you couldn't do before yeah yep just it's buying edges that's actually pretty sweet at the it for for your strain slots um yeah, hand to hand it's pricey but it's worth it yeah yeah it's cool hand to hand reaction wiring allows you plus two to fighting checks so basically it's like you know some karate all of a sudden um yeah, yeah your reflexes are faster yeah you your hands move to where you know your opponent's fists or weapons are attacking to and you're a much better fighter ranged data system what do you do with this thing now this one's pretty this one's pretty cool pretty much what they did is they took the power armor and robot systems package the optics package such as um everything that that integrates their systems in a cyborg for them to be able to shoot for that tracks movement multiple targets checks ranges lots of other factors they put them all into one system that you can buy one package you can um it costs you twenty thousand credits one strain and um each application of the upgrade offsets two points of penalties for shooting so anybody who uses power armor or robots and rifts knows that the automated um optics package and and radar and combat package for power armor and robots does the same thing. It takes away two points. So here's a good example. You have you do not have a ranged data system. You're not a cyborg or have any cybernetic. You shoot with your sniper rifle and you have a minus two penalty to range. All right. You roll your dice, you take away the two points, and now you missed because it was it, it was too hard of a shot. Now you get a range data system installed and it gets rid of two points of penalties. So now it's a straight die roll. There's no uh, penalty to the run. That's cool. In the same case. Yeah. And for 20,000 credits, if you're a sniper, if you're, uh, you know, a combat oriented type of character, um, even if you're not, that's still going to come in handy. Yeah. And then you, you combine that with your targeting eye. That's going to give you plus two. You're almost never going to miss. Yeah. Well, that's an automatic. Yeah. At, at, at extreme range, you're going to be getting a pretty much a straight die roll. And that's pretty good. Sweet. Communication, data, and sensory systems. So these ones are going to be pretty straightforward. You got your audio package that's going to allow you to get a, a roll on your notice for one strain, 40,000 credits. That's pretty good. You can hear yeah, things. Gonna, yeah, exactly. Stuff. You can hear a pin drop at 100 yards, pretty much is what they're telling you. The, core, um, the next one is, a yeah, that core electronics package. You got it. 22,000 yeah. credits will get you a mini computer, an interface jack, and it gives you bonuses to your repair checks and your common knowledge rolls in addition to a 20 mile range radio. Um, I don't know about you, but radios have saved my butt more to remember. <laughs> would, a, would an EMP burst basically just give you like a, a meltdown? Yeah, it'll fry that. That's $22,000 down the drain. <laughs> but well. you still take the strain. Even if it gets destroyed, you don't get that strain back. Because now you're running around you now you're running around with dead cybernetics mounted into your chest, head, neck, nerves. Oh, is there an EMP yeah. gun you can get in this game where I could blast people with there, stuff like there that? There are some weapons and some oh, um, yeah. grenades and missiles that do um yeah, EMP electromagnetic um, pulses. Yep. Nice. Environmental yes, sir, sensors. Combat cyborgs hate those things. <laughs> this environmental sensors, it allows you to detect other people's toots when you're not paying attention. And you're like, who did it? And everybody knows that it was that guy because you can tell. The lasers coming out of your eyes are focusing on you. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen yeah, that? Yeah, so the system works out to like 24 inches, um, but you don't get the plus two bonus. If it's within 12 inches, you get a notice check at plus two. And, you know, it detects radiation levels, air quality, air quality, all those related effects. With it. It, it comes in pretty handy if you are a cybernetic or a combat cyborg that's going to be in some pretty hellacious type uh, combat environments or just environments in general um hot water geysers or their seismic activity you know like the palo verde nuclear power plant just west of phoenix yeah west of phoenix um that would probably not be somewhere i would want to go visit after the world exploded but this <laughs> stuff keeps you from getting close to that so yeah, yeah it helps there's yeah, lots I... of other fun stuff in there there's expanded detection and security arrays um that one gives you some bonuses notice and danger sense language translators always fun because you always meet the dbs that do not speak english mm -hmm. um optics That's cool. packages are pretty simple yeah cybernetic eyes you want to replace those just because you want to look into somebody's pretty eyes. But um, cybernetic eyes are kind of cool. I like the optics package because it gives you 50 times magnification and a 20 times macro lens. So you can really see a lot of details at distance in the dark with different variations of thermal imaging, night image, you know, illumination penalty. So it's kind of nice to be able to get those details whenever you um, ask the GM. So how far can I see and what details do I see? I look across the lake and look into the color of her eyes. 
your cybernetic eyes will allow you to do that. It yes. also gives you a plus two checks to avoid being flash, um, avoid those wonderful flashbang grenades that to throw. Um, in addition to like light burst effects from flares and other stuff like that. And then the optics package also allows you the ability to record still and moving images. So, you know, you can take pictures of her wonderful, beautiful like that later. Oh, you're such a romantic, Victor. <laughs> yeah, but hey, it's 50,000 credits an eye. It, it better do all that. Yeah, there's, um, I, I don't remember. Oh, I know what it's called. It's, is, is it Black Mirror is the new, sort of the new Twilight Zone? Is, is the... Correct. Okay, Correct. so have you seen the one where people get the optics package put in their eyes and it allows them to record everything? And they have like... Um, like an Apple, um, uh, what do I want to call it? Like the the Apple TV box, the Apple TV remote, and and they can like spin it back in a circle and go back in time and record different things and oh yeah and stuff like yeah. yeah. There's a really good um, episode that deals with all of that stuff, and that's in one of the editions of Black Mirror. If if you're interested in the optics package and want to get a little bit more insight into how that can sort of mess with somebody, even if you're like in a relationship, that was a really cool um, episode of Black Mirror. Very nice. I'm gonna have to check that out. I like it. Mm -hmm. Signal booster. If when you really need to get your your communication stuff extended there. You know, I've used Signal Booster to bounce radio waves from or radio signals from one person to another very long distances. Um, it's pretty much a repeater, right? It whatever it takes in, it'll transmit it and bounce it up to 500 miles. What a lot of people don't realize is that there's a lot of hackers and other people out who can also hear that signal that you're boosting. So um, I kind of hold that against my player characters until the, it becomes important. Then they realize, oh, crap, we shouldn't use a signal boost because everyone else is. But this one gives you a bonus to your survivor roles whenever you're trying to pick a location to navigate. But it also helps when you have, um, you're, you know, you need to send out a rescue call for support or whatever. 500 miles is a pretty way to go. So that's yeah. always nice to have. You know who could have used the signal booster? Yeah. <laughs> This guy Milo that I used to work with, he was a bit nutty, and uh, so this is this is actually I kid you not, Victor. This is a true story. We hired the guy. He came to work for us, and he was nutty. About a week into it, into training, he's sitting in the truck, and we're just having general conversations. I do a lot of training at work. Um, over the last ten years, I've been the go-to guy. Everybody that comes in sort of has to get through me to get their foot in the door. Milo shows up. He's doing fine. Everything's good. A week into it, he tells me this story about, um, he says to me, do you know why when the aliens, or you hear noises from the aliens, only you can hear them? The reason is, is because they shoot them into your ear on a laser beam, an audio laser beam that goes right into your ear. So you know what, what Milo liked to do? Milo liked to sit on his roof of his mobile home and he used to take this um, a metal like salad bowl and he would hold it up to his ear and reflect the laser audio beam back at the aliens. And then he tells me this and then immediately starts laughing like it's the funniest thing ever. Like, ha, 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 I showed those aliens. <laughs> that is a true story. It gets even and better. The, and, the, and this is the type of people that live in Canada. <laughs> it gets even better. So poor Milo. Um, was at his house. Oh, he lived down in this place called Hazelmere, Hazelmere, Hazelmere Park, Mobile Home Park. True story. A couple years ago, I'm going to say five plus, there was a hot air balloon that crashed into the mobile home park late one night. About three days later, we get a phone call from Milo. He had disappeared. And we're like, Milo, Milo phones up uh, our dispatcher and he, and he says to dispatch, he's like, you got to get me out of here. I, I'm, I'm in this Riverdale, I think, or no, Riverside is, is the mental institution. And so they get to talking and Steve says, he says, sorry, I can't help you. They're listening. And then Milo hung up. But it turns out <laughs> the truth of the story is I probably should be laughing at this, but the truth of the story is, is that <clears throat> being that he already had this inclination to believe in aliens and this hot air balloon crashed into his mobile home park, it caught him off guard. Like it set the place on fire, fire truck showed up, all sorts of stuff happened. They found him walking down the street in his underwear at like three o'clock in the morning, out of his mind, kind of crazy because of all of the stuff that had happened. And then they took him to the loony bin. 
Yep, that'll land you in the loony bin every single time. Crazy. That's my, that's my true story for the for the episode. All right. Poor so, Milo. <laughs> poor Milo, right? I mean, it's funny in a sad way. I'll probably cut that out because uh, that sort of makes me look like an asshole. It's just going to say poor Milo. <laughs> poor Milo. Subject matter export port. What's this do? So this is like buying a single skill chip. Um, if you need the knowledge arcana skill, um, you can pretty much purchase it for a certain amount of strain per port, and it gives you um, a number of dice. Um, I think it gives you up to four dice types. You can buy 3,000 for the first port, 2,000 credits for the one die type, 1,000 for four die type skill chips. So you pretty much learn anything, knowledge, engineering, athletics, shooting, whatever you want. Wow, cool. Vehicle interface package. So you could just like stick your finger in the key slot and make it go. Whatever you want to put in the slot. Nice. Wilderness scout package, plus two to all survival and tracking. Pretty straightforward. So this would just be like another little... You know, maybe it pops up with a, a heads up display in your eyeball or something like that that right. always shows you which way magnetic north is, kind of something along those lines. Sure, a little bit more sophisticated than that. But yeah, you have the right idea. Bonuses to all of your survival and your tracking. Um, you know, it'll allow you to track visual visually any sense that you have. You can identify certain types of tracks by their depth, their weight, their, you know, size, mass, that kind of, all kinds of fun information and data you can get from Wilderness Scout Package. A lot of the rangers in Canada have wilderness scout packs for obvious reasons it's a lot of wilderness. Mm -hmm. makes yeah. them badasses that's why just yeah, like because they're the already Canadians. badasses but that just makes them even more <laughs> um, yeah last but not least is the wired skill port this one's an unlimited um cybernetic that you can get it's similar to um or not similar to but it if you have cyber wired reflexes you can get a port that accepts a single chip just like we talked about earlier with buying skills and buying edges but this one allows you to grant or improve an agility link skill. So it's a free action to change the chip. And it's, you know, it's pretty much taking it, plugging it in and out like small disc um, into your brain or arm or leg or whatever you want to plug it into. But it adds or increases one specific agility link skill up to four dice types. You can buy it up to four times. Um, if you do so, it's 40,000 credits for a four die type skill chip. But if you happen to need shooting because you are not a good rifleman, and you need to make that sniper shot. Um, hold on a minute. Let me switch out chips. Reach into your bag of, of chips, literally. Pull one into your head. Okay, and now all of a sudden you become an Olympic target shoot. That is freaking sweet. So you could literally like sort of buy this wired skill port. And if you had yeah. enough credits or whatever, you could actually set it up so that you could say, okay, I need to shoot. Bloop, put your chip in. Uh, I need yep. to be good at investigating. Bloop, you put the chip yep. in. That's freaking sweet. At as I need to be an Olympic gymnast. Where's that acrobat chip? Uh, yeah, all that fun stuff. It's it's pretty much, if you can think it, they can put it in your brain if you have enough credits. Man, and I usually, need that one. What I tend to do is if they are buying them from the black market, I tend to double or triple the prices. These are just mm. the standard prices if you could buy them off the shelf from a legal vendor um, somewhere in Chai Town or somewhere in one of the major developed city that are left in the, in the world. You why can get you so, them for that discount price. Why a discount price of double? Why are you so mean to your players? Oh no, triple is the going rate for black market pricing. Wow, that's <laughs> oh I see. That's still that's stiff. So you got yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got four. Yeah, I, forms. I make them earn it. That's for sure. There, there's no experience points in Savage World, so you know, or not a lot of them. So I, when it comes to credits, I've got guys walking around with two million, two million um, credits worth of, of cred sticks that they use. I'm floating around from different types of sticks all the time. Wow. So you got you got four choices for mobility. Aquatic, booster jets, climbing, and legs. And those Basically. are kind of given, right? You get to you get to climb really well. You can run and jump pretty good. Um, booster jets are just, you know, quick power jumps. And then aquatic mode, hello, who doesn't want to swim it? Yeah, sign me up. That could underwater with the aquatic mode and booster jets. Not only are you going really fast, but by the you know if you spun around, maybe you maybe you boosted a, a fish and cooked it while you were like trying to get away. Yeah, you can boost out of the water as you're you know as you're cresting the top of a wave or something and oh. land on the beach. You know, just you know it would be super cool, man. You come up on some dudes on some jet skis or something like that, and you're underneath them. Maybe you're tracking them down. All of a sudden, you boost her up out of the water from behind them and just gun them down in a blaze of glory and bullets. Mm hmm. Nice. Weapons and tools. This is going to be it for the cybernetics. What kind of stuff we, can we get here? Can so we as get a always, everyone always wants close combat weapons, but what if you could have them built in? <laughs> I just so. read long <laughs> fingers. <laughs> yes. There you go. 
Yeah, you know, everything from blades out of your forearms, just like Wolverine, to, you know, spikes out of your elbows or shoulder um, prongs or whatever you want to call them. Um, so you treat the strain as one for every five pounds of a weapon that you want to add to uh, as a built-in close combat weapon. It could be scalpels in your fingertips. It could be, you know, a, a regular combat knife or a Bowie knife out of the palm of your hand, whatever you want to fit into there um, within those limitations. And then you multiply the cost by one and a half. And then you get the cybernetic version cost. So you pay that cost and you pay the strain and you're good to go. Lock pick fingers, man. You're literally Inspector Gadget at this point. Oh, yeah. They give you plus two to all your lock picking checks and you can take it more than once. Mining drill apparatus. You could have that built in so you could have like a drill arm. Mm -hmm. So like your your hand could, you know, um, your hand could break off at the wrist and rotate all the way back and a, a small drill will come out. You'll be able to do some, lots of other fun stuff. You could have a... A jackhammer on the other hand on the base of the other hand breaking up the rock as you're drilling through it or whatever that could make some for some pretty interesting characters especially if you were like uh, say you were an enslaved um cyber uh what's it called combat cyborg you're an enslaved combat cyborg and you were turned into a, a mining drill um you know pretty much a human mining drill and then uh, you escaped so you still have the mining drill parts yeah now you're like drilling into power power armor and all of that kind of good stuff. That's actually oh yeah, so yeah. Jumping onto the back of a robot and you know breaking out your your mining drill out of your wrist um really opens the eyes of the robot pilot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that or you know you need to get through a door, but you, you, your lockpick oh, fingers yeah. maybe aren't cutting it. You know, like yeah. screw this, I'm just going to drill through it. <laughs> I'm just going to yeah, just going to drill out the lock and be done with it. All right, yeah, the it's, last it's one. an improvised weapon and it gives you strength to plus two d six in mega damage with an armor piercing of ten. So, um, yeah, you've got a pretty good chance of turning that robot into a can opener. That is insane. That is so cool. Man, I just I want to do that now. I just want to go do that to somebody. <laughs> well, that uh, Leyline Walker that had his hand replaced with a spatula. Yeah, that guy sucked. Who are we kidding? <laughs> yeah, he give didn't... him a mining drill instead. I, th I think that's where he's going, man. How much does that cost? 60,000 credits? Sign a brother 60, up? Yep. Two strain. You can only take it once, of course. But, yeah, that's you get some pretty good stuff. That's all you yeah. need. How many drills do you need? Can you replace the bits? Then you're good to go. Oh, yeah. See, it says that the drill can cut through a square foot of material per round. So that's some pretty devastating stuff right there. That is craziness. Uh, so last but not least, here we go. The ultimate walking tool kit package. Does this come with some kind of cool shoes that have those like uh, built-in roller blades or whatever? Only for you, Gary. Only for you. Did, did I read <laughs> so it right? No. So the ultimate walking tool kit package you become a walking toolkit. What it means is that oh. you have <laughs> tools embedded all over the place. Everything from small knives, screwdrivers, you know, forks, uh, tape measures, all kinds of special ratchets and wrenches and all kinds of other stuff. So you always have a tool for every single um, occasion. And because of that, you get a plus two to your repair checks. 18,000 <laughs> credits for the Ultimate Mechanics Walking Toolkit. Okay, so I thought that it was a toolkit to make you an ultimate walker because <laughs> you know sometimes you, you gotta really walk want it to gary you can so, sometimes you gotta walk between cities i thought it was something cool that would like make walking places easier <laughs> there you go ladies and gentlemen now, there's your new cybernetic uh, tool for the day <laughs> oh man those moments that you have okay well coolness that's awesome <laughs> you basically become a human uh what do you call those swiss army knife yeah pretty much Nice. I think that's where they got the idea for it. All right. On that note, let's get out of here. We've been at this for far too long, and I, my eyeballs are starting to hurt. <laughs> let's portal out of here, Victor. Oh, uh, whoa, uh, bloody hell. Oh, man, I love this guy. Do we have to go yet? Yes. Oh, please. Of, of course we do. We've got work to do. Please, can we stay just a little bit longer? Stop it, Jeffrey. Oh, right, come on back through the rift there. The sweet sound of that rift opening means it's time to pick up, pack up, portal out, and take us out with some contact, Commander Victor. Ladies and gentlemen, you can reach us at the Murder Hobo Show at gmail.com or get us on Twitter if you can keep it under 140 characters at Murder Hobo Show. Or, of course, over at the Google Plus page, Murder Hobo Show under the Nerds International banner. You can reach out to myself directly at the Google Plus page for Savage Rifts where the community's always making up some fun stuff, not just the ultimate walking toolkit, but lots <laughs> of other things that you can dare pick you. out. <laughs> <laughs> lots of other things that you guys can pick up from the community. There's there's a, a character book that we're working on. We have last year's 
um, Riffs, Savage Rifts Annual that has a slew of information, fun forms, and lots of other fun character classes you can play in there. Come check it out. Nice. Be sure to swing by the Murder Hobo Show on Podbean. Check out the show notes for some links to cool, creative people, places, and things. Don't forget to catch our other podcast, The Threats, Treats, and Timers, where we talk about one of our favorite role-playing game systems of the year, Index Card Role-Playing Game. Oh, yeah. Tune in next time. We'll have another action-packed show. As we're going to be covering, I believe it's Adventure Gear, which this actually looks pretty cool. Some of the different kind of guns and, and cloaks and jet packs and different things like that that you can get. Yeah, we'll go over Adventure and Gear, and I think we'll have some time to be able to talk about Techno Wizard conversions and upgrades, which is something we talked about earlier in this in this episode. Fantastic. All right, let's get out of here. Adios, amigos. Here's a quick addendum. Sadly, with G Plus closing its doors, we are looking for a new home. Victor and myself have moved our G Plus communities over to Mew, currently the best option for the material and content we create. If you are interested in joining us, you can find us at mew.com forward slash join forward slash murder underscore hobo underscore show or mew.com forward slash join forward slash savage underscore riffs. I'll put the links in the show notes because that might be a touch confusing, but Mew has some nice features. It allows anyone to create a personal group and easily share that content with other groups. You can set up an event, for example, an online game, post it to the group, and then that event has a specific instant chat function. You can drop in GIFs, uh, images, text, whatever you like to communicate with the group to make sure that everything goes accordingly and your group is you know, well set up and taken care of. With G Plus closing, it seems that a large portion of G Plus users have migrated to this platform, which is nice for convenience as well, because personally, I would prefer not to have a different app for every group I enjoy. Mew has a nice web interface and a nice Android app, and the setup is extremely workable. Hopefully, we'll see you there. Mew.com The Murder Hobo Show is not affiliated with or endorsed by any companies mentioned on this show. Any of the products mentioned on our show or appear on our website are the property and copyright of their respected owners. All items are used under fair use and education or review purposes. All other items are the intellectual property of the Murder Hobo Show, copyright 2018, all rights reserved.